Do you have any idea what IQ, OQ, and PQ stand for? IQ is installation qualification, OQ is operational qualification, and PQ is performance qualification. And I've heard a couple other variations of those three acronyms of what they mean. But those are the three acronyms that we use to describe the three traditional parts of process validation that is used by the medical device industry and the pharmaceutical industry when you have automated equipment. And what's really important isn't to remember what IQ, OQ, PQ stand for, but to understand what the purpose of each part of it is. Now, for the regulations, the regulation for the U.S. is 21 CFR 820.75. That's for process validation. Um, and then we also have an ISO standard, um, ISO 1345. You might have heard of it. And in there, in clause 7.5.6, is a requirement for process validation. And then they have an additional clause, 7.5.7, for sterilization validation and validation of um, barrier, sterile barriers. So these are the basic requirements that you have out there. But then they have specific standards for different types of validation, like EO steriliz sterilization, gamma sterilization, and packaging validation, and shipping validation. All these different types of validation, if there's a standard, that's what you should follow. But when you create your own manufacturing process in your company, it's an automated process, you might not have a standard that you can go to or you might only have a standard for part of it. So you have to come up with your own IQ, OQ, and PQ protocols, and then you write a report after the protocols, after you've executed the actual study. So the purpose of the IQ is to make sure the equipment is installed correctly. That's simple. The second part is to make sure that you've identified what is the safe operating window that you can work in. So what's the lowest temperature? What's the highest temperature? What's the lowest pressure? What's the highest pressure? We try to create boundaries, upper and lower limits that you can operate the process at. And it isn't always linear. For instance, at one pressure, you might have one temperature that will work and one pressure um, one temperature and one time period that'll work. And then as you increase the pressure, you might be able to reduce the temperature. You might be able to reduce the time. So it could shift slightly over time, depending on the interaction between the different variables. So you have to design an experiment. They do a lot of designing the experiments as part of OQs to try to figure out what is the range of safe operating parameters so I'll get the product characteristics that I want. So how, how long do I have to clean it for? How long do, um, how fast does this piece of equipment need to turn? Um, those are some of the variables they would look at. If you're, if you're machining something, they talk about feeds and speeds. How quickly can I feed the metal into the machine? And how quickly can I um, have the spindle or, or tool turning on this device and get a good finish on the product? So, those are some of the things that we look at when we're looking at OQs. The final step, the PQ, this is typically where we're looking at lot-to-lot -lot variability. So when you're looking at lot-to-lot -lot variability, you want to have different lots of raw materials that were evaluated. You also might want to look at different operators if there's a manual component to the process. You might look at different operating conditions, so temperatures, humidities. You might look at... <coughs> um, um, what time of year it is, because sometimes that affects the um, amount of um, moisture that's in a product. Uh, it might also affect the operating temperature that you're working in. It certainly affects the, the amount of static that's on products. Um, in the winter, you'll get a lot more static. In the summer, because we have more humidity in the air, you get less static. So some of those variables matter when you're doing lot-to-lot -lot variability. So we like to look at... Um, lots over a period of time as well. But because companies are usually doing this validation when they first start out, they often do them in a very short period of time and they may not have a lot of lots of material to work with and there might not be a lot of variability in those lots. So sometimes the PQs that we do are less than perfect. 
But the kind of testing that we're going to do for the PQ, we typically run at the nominal condition in the middle of that wide operating range that we determined in the OQ. We run at the nominal condition in the middle, and we run with multiple lots. And we do the final tests um, that we would do for that product to make sure it passes those specifications. In the OQ, you might only look at certain process variables that are a really good indicator of whether the process is working correctly or not, because you're going to try a whole bunch of different conditions, and it's not cost effective to check every single sample from every single uh, condition that you ran at. And you might not even have enough samples to run every test, because some of the tests might be destructive. Um, if you're doing, let's say, bio burden, and you're going to do cytotoxicity, you can't run both on the same sample. You've got to pick one test to do on them. <clears throat> so you might not have enough samples to do every test that you want to do. So you're going to pick what is going to be the best indicator of whether I'm in a safe operating range or I'm outside of the safe range and I really need to change the parameters back towards the middle. So those are the three basic types of validation testing that we're going to do. The installation qualification, we look at maintenance procedures. Are they established? Do we have a PM plan? Have we calibrated the device? Have we installed the electricity correctly? Have we installed the utilities like water and sewage correctly to the device? Um, so those are the one, things we do in the IQ, but each one has a different purpose. Each one has different testing you do. They're not all the same. You're, it's like, if I do this for this test, then I have to do it for the others too. No, that's not the case. Um, and you can always do more testing. So you have to use a risk-based approach. If it's a very um, stable process that's very consistent and you have very little variability, you can um, do less testing and less sampling. If you have a very uh, an extremely variable raw material, Three lots is arbitrary and that might not be enough. You might need to look at a wider range of lots. Um, one of the things that um, the FDA did during COVID, they had a lot of variability that we were seeing in masks that were coming into the United States from other countries, surgical masks. So one of the things that they changed in their policies, they have been letting companies do just five samples for each of the tests that they were doing and they changed their policy and said, no, 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 we're going to switch back to you have to follow the statistical uh, policies for sampling. And so we want an AQL of 4.0 and we want a minimum of 32 samples and we want three non-consecutive lots. That's not what you do for every single process out there. It depends on the variability of that process. But they were seeing a lot of variability, lots a lot from different manufacturers. So they enforced that. So, and that was appropriate given the amount of variability they were seeing in the quality of the product. Um, if those companies had done a better job of making sure they had consistency of the raw materials coming in and more consistency in the manufacturing controls, then that might not have been necessary and it might never have happened. So having, having a good understanding of how variable your process is determines how much you would do. And people would like to think, well, this is how it shall be done. It's very black and white but that's not the case. Um, there are some processes that are fairly black and white. For instance, sterilization. You have a standard, you have requirements for the IQ, OQ, PQ. You can look up the, what you're supposed to do on a chart, but these are based on uh, a process that, that's been established over hundreds of years. Um, you know, it goes all the way back to microbiology and tindalization flasks in, in basic microbiology of hundreds of years ago. So what we learned hundreds of years ago is what that's based on, whereas what we're doing for, um, let's say, uh, wire EDM processes might be quite different because the wire EDM hasn't been around all that long. Um, same thing with 3D printing. One of the newer processes that manufacturers are using, you're going to have a little bit different controls for a 3D printing process. Everything's automated, but at the same time, it's a very new technology. So regulators are a little bit more uh, careful in how they uh, pr approach it and they want to be extra cautious because a lot of these parts are going to be used for implants, which would be high risk. So now that I've answered the question of what is the basics of IQ, OQ, and PQ, if you're looking for a really good resource, I put in the comments um, uh, a link that you can use, and I'm actually sharing that down below. Um, 
if you just type into Google or any browser, um, um, IQ or not IQ OQP2, um, G, GHTF for Global Harmonization Task Force, and then process validation. If you type those three um, items into your browser, you should be able to find the Global Harmonization Task Force document that is a guidance on how to do process validation. And they actually give you an example in the back of an IQ, an OQ, a PQ, and they even give you a validation plan uh, that you would um, that you don't have to follow that one, but you could model your um, validation plan after that. And they also have a Word version that you can download. And so then you can edit it to be your own. And if you're looking for what the FDA wants for a submission, when you have a report, um, typically you have, here's what our plan was, our predetermined acceptance criteria. That's one of the things they're looking for in your protocol. And then you have your report that has the actual data and summary and conclusions. Some companies combine the two together. They'll have a report with fill in the blanks and a place for collecting the data, like a data table. And so when they fill it in, the blank form becomes a record or a report. And then the only thing they really have to do is create a summary at the end to go with it. Um, but if you're looking for what the FDA's minimum requirements are for a summary report of a validation, they actually have published that. So you can actually look under non-clinical um, non report uh, requirements or something, um, but FDA non-clinical report guidance is what I would probably type in, and that should get you the guidance document that tells you what the minimum requirements are and what they're looking for in a report. So if you have all those things in your report, it meets the requirements. So that's how you do an IQ, OQ, PQ. I've given you some resources that you can hunt down. If you need more help on that, there's also a um, I don't have it in handy reach, but um, there's a, um, a guidance document out there or a, a book that was published by RAPS. I was one of the authors that contributed to it. It was um, a fairly thick textbook, and it has all kinds of different process validations in there. Um, I wrote the regulatory section with another author, but there's in there stuff in there about cleaning validation, software validation, cybersecurity. A lot of different stuff in there that would be really helpful if you're looking for something specific that's very technical and some resources. I hope that was helpful to you. Uh, next week, I'll probably be doing a, a video from the beach. So let me know what you want to do, what you want us to do next week for a video in the comments, and I'll be looking for your comments so we can plan next week's video. See you then. Bye-bye.